Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the voice of reason. Today, we are continuing our ongoing coverage of the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. So as we all know, over the past uh, several days, uh, starting uh, back on December 29th, uh, the Russians uh, initiated a very large uh, missile and drone campaign against the Ukrainian military. There has been hundreds of Russian drone and cruise missile strikes over the past several days, going all the way back to the uh, just before the start of the new year. Now, <clears throat> we have seen a wide range of weapon systems being used by the Russians. We have seen the normal array of uh, geranium kamikaze drones. I would say at this point the vast majority or a significant majority of the of the weapons that have been launched against Ukrainian targets have been these uh, these uh, slower moving kamikaze type drones. Now they have also interdispersed ballistic missiles, Iskanders. They have uh, used uh, the uh, the dagger. The Kinjal, uh, NATO reporting uh, Killjoy. They have used uh, converted KH twenty uh, twenty twos, KH twenty twos, which are uh, traditionally uh, used against large naval vessels. Those have been converted uh, to a ground attack role. Now it's interesting that on one hand the ukrainians will say we have we have a very difficult time the air defense network of ukraine has a very difficult time shooting down kh-22s again these are are, are high mock uh, attack systems they travel very fast mock three high mock two the the dagger, the Kinzhal, the air launch system that uh, is essentially a uh, an air launched Iskander. Again, a a very fast moving target that travels at at fairly high altitude. Now. Again, on one hand, the Ukrainians say, hey, look, we have difficulty shooting down these these 22s. We have difficulty shooting down the S-400s, the S-300s. And again, the Russians convert the S-300 to a ground attack role. Not too difficult to do, and they're fairly, uh, and they're fairly accurate. And again, very fast moving target to try and intercept with the uh, air defense network that the Ukrainians possess. Now, they do have some Patriots and the Ukrainians, on, on the other hand, are reporting a high degree of success in terms of shooting down anything and everything that gets near Kiev. Even recently, where 10 of these uh, daggers were fired at Kiev, the Ukrainians report that they shot down all 10 systems. They shot down all 10 of these approaching targets towards Kiev. Now again, very interesting, again, they'll say they shot down 10 of these, 100%, while at the same time they say it's very difficult to shoot them down, and we don't really have that capability of shooting some of those, uh, some of those systems down. The Ukrainians are able to shoot down the, uh, the uh, slower-moving uh, cruise missiles, but, again, they say they have difficulty shooting down these hypersonic missiles. But, again, once the attack takes place, the Ukrainians then allege they, they shot them all down. Now, <clears throat> there ha- has been 
numerous, numerous impact points throughout Ukraine that have been documented. And the Ukrainians don't report military casualties of, of any sort. We do know that in Kiev, whatever was, was struck in Kiev was, uh, was very sensitive. We have intel that indicates the Russians may have been going after uh, some very key, prominent members of the Ukrainian military. Now, who that was, we don't know. But we do know something was struck in Kiev that was incredibly sensitive. And we think because of the, the mum silence that that target, whatever that target was by the Russians, was in fact destroyed. Now some would say it, it is a, uh, a direct report to uh, General Zaluzhny. It could have been a confidant or even uh, the targeting of Volodymyr Zelensky. But we do know targets were hit in Kiev and were not, in fact, shot down. We know that there were very large explosions recorded on the ground in Kiev. So that leads us to believe whatever the Russians were going after, they hit. Now, again, no matter what the success was of the uh, Russian military in the course of these strikes, the Ukrainians are not going to report a successful hit on a target. They're just not going to do that. The... Co the most common narrative, again, out of Kiev right now is we just shoot down all Russian missiles <laughs> that approach Kiev, 100%. But, but again, on the other hand, they'll say, well, we have, we have a great deal of difficulty of intercepting these missiles. On top of that, we hear about the shortages of some of these uh, very expensive air defense missiles that the Ukrainians are running out of, such as the Patriot. So very difficult to make heads or tails of what's happening on the ground, to actually know what's being hit, what's not being hit. We know stuff is being hit. Now, what's the success rate of the uh, actual... Ukrainian air defense network in terms of shooting down these these Russian missiles and drones. We just don't know. We just don't know. And I don't think anyone really knows except the Ukrainian military. Maybe the Russians. Uh, they have the ability of doing post-strike analysis to see if they actually hit a target. And we do know the Russians have launched barrages of these missiles. And then they have launched more barrages of these missiles against Ukrainian targets. So they have a list of targets they're going after. The Ukrainians are not reporting a great deal of civilian deaths. You'll hear about four, you'll hear about 20, 30. Look, if, if this was a concerted effort <clears throat> by the Russians to cause civilian casualties. The casualties would be in the thousands. There would be thousands of civilians killed if the Russians, again, were going after civilian targets. But that's not happening. We're not seeing thousands of civilians being killed. So we believe the Russians are legitimately going after military targets, whether it's warehouses where uh, NATO and U.S. Uh, munitions are being stored, <clears throat> whether it's uh, command and control sites where Ukrainian military formations are active or being housed. 
those seem to be the targets the Russians are going after. And even on the uh, flip side of, of, uh, of the, the, uh, the Ukrainian military. If the Ukrainian military wanted to cause massive amounts of civilian casualties such as uh, targeting Donetsk, they could do that. And we would see a casualty rate that is much higher. We would probably see a higher rate of casualties even uh, in front line cities such as uh, Belgorod if the Ukrainians wanted to cause massive amounts of civilian casualties. So I think both sides are tempering their efforts in terms of trying to reduce civilian casualties. Now look, the narrative with both sides is not that. They'll say the other side is, is targeting civilians. But again, especially the Russians. If the Russians wanted to cause just massive amounts of civilian casualties, it, it would be a much, much higher than just 20 or 30 Ukrainian uh, civilians killed in, if, if 50 aim points were struck. If, if we turn those 50 military aim points into civilian aim points, again, the casualties would be off the charts. The Ukrainians, for the most part, defend their military sites. Their key military and industrial sites are being protected by the Ukrainians. That's what comes first. And especially uh, Kiev. Kiev is probably the best protected area in Ukraine right now. Obviously it has Patriot missile systems and there are other systems as well. <clears throat> that are being used by the Ukrainians to protect Kiev. Now on the front lines, <clears throat> we are continuing to see this, this, this war of uh, incrementalism by the Russians. The Russians move forward, they, uh, they attack, they identify these Ukrainian strong points by the amount of resistance the Ukrainians are offering. Once that's identified, then the Russians bring in their heavy artillery, they bring in other systems, and they just start to level that area where there was heavy Ukrainian resistance. Now, sometimes they're successful, other times they're not so successful. There have been attacks where the Russians have taken heavy losses. There has been probing attacks by the Russians where they have taken not so many losses. And they have then inflicted devastating losses on the Ukrainians. But at this point, in, in our assessment, we believe that the Ukrainians are taking more casualties right now in this phase of the conflict than the Russians are. Early in the conflict, the early days of the conflict, I, I would say that the Russians were taking more casualties. The early days, where you had large maneuver formations of Russians attempting to take uh, large amounts of Ukrainian territory. Those uh, ambushes that were set up by the Ukrainians were very effective and killed and wounded and destroyed lots of Russian vehicles, tanks, and personnel. But again, now the war has changed. We're not seeing the Russians taking those kinds of casualties in the war that exists now. Again, incremental. Identify areas where there is Ukrainian resistance, and especially running from Kupiansk all the way south to just south of Donetsk. This appears to be, this area here, this kind of this eastern sector of the conflict. This area where my cursor is going back and forth. At this time, appears to be the most active area in terms of ground fighting taking place. The Russians, are again, are using aircraft and cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and drones all over Ukraine, constantly. And in recent days, in the last 
since December 29th has really picked up quite a bit. And we're, we're kind of seeing the fruits of the uh, Russian production capacity in terms of producing many more missiles and those systems that they need to use against the Ukrainians. Now, <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the South, it's essentially status quo. There are small formations of Ukrainians still operating on the, the, the eastern bank of the Dnieper River. The Russians have no apparent desire to move into this area. Again, the Ukrainians can use HIMARS and other systems to target uh, Russian formations in these areas. So the Russians don't really see any benefit, just a cost versus benefit analysis by the Russians. And they don't really see any benefit. They see a cost of maintaining their forces. And just as the Ukrainians, there is a, a large cost by the Ukrainians to maintain forces on this eastern bank. There's not a lot of Ukrainians here, but nonetheless there are some. And the Ukrainians are able to say, hey, we have a foothold on the eastern bank of the Dnieper River. Well, they can say that, but in reality it's just swampy marshland and you have a few Ukrainians running around in, in basements on this uh, eastern bank of the river. It, uh, it really amounts to nothing in terms of w how, how the Russians see that threat because they don't really see a threat. They don't see the Ukrainian ability to launch uh, large-scale ground conventional operations to take and control territory uh, in Kherson. The, the Ukrainians don't have that capability. Now, they can shape a narrative by saying, hey, look, <clears throat> we control these areas along the Dnieper River. Okay, great. But in terms of grand strategy and ultimately winning the conflict, what the Ukrainians are doing in this sector of the conflict is, is, is not going to help their cause. <clears throat> so uh, that's kind of where we're at for today. Uh, we anticipate we will continue to see the Russians... Uh, over the course of the winter, continue to use their uh, missile capacity, their drone capability, their uh, their ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, what have you, against Ukrainian targets. And we expect th the same narrative from Ukraine as well. Hey, the Russians launched upteen missiles and we were able to shoot them all down. At the, at the end of the day, no one really knows what was hit except the two opposing parties. The Russians will say, hey, yes, we went after this target and it was destroyed and we're confident that we KIA'd or wounded a certain amount of Ukrainian troops. <clears throat> and then the Ukrainians will be bombed. They will say nothing. And we expect that to, uh, to continue until we actually see or start to see very large-scale offensive operations by the Russians designed to seize and take control of uh, territory. This is what the Russians want to do at this point. They are slowly degrading and destroying the Ukrainian military through the use of heavy artillery and missiles. And this is going to continue for some time. Now, at a certain point, the Ukrainians are going to get desperate. What does that look like? What happens then? Difficult to say. It, it does appear that as of right now, I mean, if we go back to currently where we're at right now in the conflict to where we were 90 days ago, uh, it, it definitely looks like the conflict is starting to escalate in terms of both sides uh, using missiles and drones and cruise missiles, and that's going to continue. But uh, we'll continue to watch the situation near Adivka. There are quite literally uh, a, a multitude of areas along the front line where the Russians are continuing uh, to launch offensive operations. They're not these, again, these large-scale offensive operations, but designed to locate and then destroy Ukrainian positions with either its air force or its ballistic missile or cruise missile capability. Now, <clears throat> I know that folks would like 
to have more data in terms of unit movement and who's where and what they're doing and how they're doing it. Again, very difficult to do that in this type of conflict. Very, very difficult to get information right now. So as always, we will continue to report. Thank you for joining us. More to come very, very soon. As always, have a good day.